Welcome, ladies, to the Real Estate Investor Show, providing inspiration, strategies, and insight to empower women investors to live balanced and financially free lives. Now, here are your co-hosts, Liz and Andressa. Bree Schmidt acquired her first investment property back in 2011. Then in 2014, she decided to leave the corporate world to become a full-time real estate investor. Bree owns about 100 units of investment property in addition to running three other businesses, all while making time to be with her friends and family. On today's episode, we cover so much with Bree, including the importance of becoming bankable, the number one tip to get financing in place, how boundaries allow you to get more done, and how saying no allows more peace in your life. Welcome back, ladies. This is Liz. And this is Andressa. Welcome back to the Real Estate Investor Show, where we interview amazing women investors in this business. And we also throw in some mini-sodes where we're really trying to help um, you lady investors kind of just take more on in terms of your business and take more on in terms of balance in your life and, you know, really trying to achieve freedom of, of finances as well as a peaceful life, you know, and you can have both. It just takes a little work and and figuring that out. Right, Andressa? Oh, yes. It takes a lot of work. Sometimes it seems easy on Facebook or Instagram, right? When we look around, but there's there's a ton of work that goes behind the curtains. That's why we're interviewing such amazing ladies because we want to know what is working for them and what's their secret sauce. That's right. And uh, Brie, welcome to the show. We're so glad to have you this week. Yeah, thank you for having me. Yeah, excited to jump into Bree's story. She's got a really amazing story uh, as well. And before we kind of jump into that, we like to kind of get connected to all of you and uh, appreciate all of you listening and all that good stuff. But Andressa, what's what's happening for you? What's what's uh, what's I'm, coming up for you? I wanna I wanna talk about like when you are meeting somebody one on one. Is okay. your first time connecting with that person? And lately, I I have found that I am like really selecting. Not just because I feel that I am the last cookie on the jar. I just feel that I'm respecting my time much more. And I want to make sure that the person is getting what they're looking for. So before I meet, I want to be very clear on what exactly they're looking for. If they're looking for somebody to explain how wholesaling works or anything like that, I'm not the right person for them. And so it's just a waste. So my my tip for, for the ladies that are listening to us uh, when you are looking to meet somebody, be very clear with that person what you are looking to offer and what you are looking to get. It must be a win-win situation. We mentioned in a couple of episodes that picking your brain is just not a good strategy. If you are looking to connect with somebody, try to ask a lot of questions and try to understand what the other person is is looking to get what are their needs. So he feels that it is just a win-win situation for both. And do that before you schedule the conversation um, 101. I think it's just prime time. Otherwise, if it is just a chit-chat call, it's it's fine. But 101 is just prime. And that's yeah. that's what I will tell the ladies out there. Yeah. Yeah. No. And you give your, you know, you have to remind, remind yourself of that because you can sometimes get sucked into helping and, and that's all great, but you also have to be mindful of respecting your time too. Um, I can actually jump in on this topic. Yeah. I'd love to hear your perspective. I'm sure people reach out to you all the time, Bree. And we'll, we'll kind of get into this later. Um, I just refuse to do in-person meetings. Um, I started doing that about a year ago uh, and it's awesome. So I work from home, uh, I said, I, I run, I run four companies. I completely work from home. So for me to have to get ready and do my hair and do my makeup and then drive over to you, that, that 30 minute meeting, which never ends up being 30 minutes ends up being three hours of my time. Um, mm-hmm. and I just cannot justify that. Even if you're someone that is looking to hire me to be your business partner or to work with you, you know, I generally do not accept them in person. I will mm-hmm. gladly do a 30 minute phone call. And you know what, I can, in that three hour time frame, I can do six phone calls back to back versus mm-hmm. doing an in-person meeting. And of course you have to screen. Um, like I said, yes. I, I get the same thing too. Like, hey, I want to wholesale this property in Florida. I have no idea. <laughs> like, why would you, like, what are you talking about? Uh, so it has to be, I always have to pre-screen even before I accept a phone call. Um, mm, yes. And doing that and being more selfish with my time and looking at it as, Every hour with you is an hour away from my family. 
Yeah. Um, Explain to me why I'm giving up an hour with my family, right? And I need to justify that in my head. It's mm. been the greatest thing. It has cut down the time I have spent uh, being so stressed about trying to do it all mm. because I'm just, I'm not doing it all and I don't care. That's fine. Mm-hmm. I'm being selfish. I'm putting my family and my priorities first and yeah. that's what it is. Yeah, a hundred percent. And I, I heard from another uh, business coach another day, he was saying that he does not believe in unscheduled calls. Mm-hmm. And I start, if I get a call, it's like either I don't have your number. If it is an emergency, this person is going to call me a couple of times. And if I answer, if it, there's like a specific question, Hey, I want to just understand comps. Well, there's a thing called Zillow MLS. You mm-hmm. can totally go there and get that for yourself. Yeah. It's just not, like I'm just becoming very, very conscious about how do I spend my time and I don't want to be rude to anybody, but I also want to respect me and my family, as you said, Bray, is from taking from my family, not from nobody else. And when you have that perspective, you kind of say a lot of no's and it's okay. Yeah. I say no 90% of the time, to be honest. Love that. I love that. And I think that's such a great thing for all people, especially women to, to hear because we don't have to, you know, please people. It's about what your priorities are and keeping those in in check. I love that. And we're going to get into that because I love what you have a lot to talk about with with what you call lifestyle investing, which we're we're going to get into is that definitely is something I I wrote up as something, you know, we really want to explore with you. But as we we like to do is we transition into your story, you know, and and the ladies listening, I think it's so helpful to hear how you started, you know, because there's always a story. There's always a, you know, there's always a reason that women get pulled into this. Um, You know, I don't think everyone just wakes up and I want to, and you know, buy rental property. I mean, some (laughs) people do, but I don't think everyone does. I don't know anyone that's done that. Yeah. I don't, uh, I don't either. It's usually a process. So, a process. so they dream yeah. about like being at the beach, right? You know, right. Having a margarita. Not right, 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 right. So for you, Brie, what, um, what compelled you, you know, what was it for you that pulled you into this, uh, in this business of, of investing and building this great portfolio that you have in businesses? Sure. So my, you know, I was a normal corporate worker, right? I used to work in advertising sales. I absolutely loved my job. Uh, I've been doing it for about nine years. I got to travel over the country and my whole goal was to be a female executive. Like that's where I saw my path. You know, I will be a director of some sort of sales division, you know, throughout my career. And that's what I wanted. Um, So real estate had always been kind of a side interest for me. I always just liked looking at real estate. It was a fun thing to do. Um, the time this was back in 2011, my, my husband and I were before we got engaged, we're, you know, planning the engagement and now we're going to get married and, you know, first comes love, then comes marriage, babies, (laughs) houses, like it's all these things you have to think about. Right. Um, so we live in Chicago and, you know, Chicago is a pretty expensive market, um, where the, the housing stock is less than 20% single families. So single family homes in this market you know, go for two, $300,000 more than a small apartment building. And we've got plenty of these small two to four unit apartment buildings. Mm. So that was always our plan. We would buy a building. We'd live on one floor as we needed more space. We take out some walls. We would now make it a two floor house. Mm -hmm. And then eventually we would take out some more walls and make it a three floor house. And that was just going to what we were going to do. And that was the plan. Buy one, you know, and then rent out the units and then, you know, grow into it as we needed. Um, about less than a year after we bought our first property, my father passed away and Mm -hmm. he had a very aggressive form of cancer. It was very Mm -hmm. quick. Uh, but what really messed with me is he had died literally one day before he was supposed to retire. And I just sat there and remembered all the times my dad talked about when I retire, I'm going to go do this. And when I retire, I'm going to go do that. And here I was in my late twenties being like, man, I watched this man, you know, work until his fifties and work for this life that he had wanted and then never got that life. Mm. Right. Uh, So it kind of just changed my perspective. It wasn't immediate. um, But I remember sitting down with my husband and being like, okay, how do we not work? Right. How do like, not that we don't want to not work, but how do we live the life that we want in our thirties and not wait until our sixties? Cause what Mm. happens if we don't get it? Right. Um, and we looked at a couple of different options. I said, we looked at becoming, you know, coders so that we could work from, you know, mm. a beach wherever. Uh, we looked at learning that. We looked at a bunch of things and, you know, real estate had already, we'd already owned this property. It was pretty easy. It made sense logistically. Um, and so we started to look for another property. Mm. Um, and then we looked for another property. 
Um, and that eventually it just completely took over my life. Uh, I was completely obsessed with it. Um, I ended up buying like 18 properties in nine months, quit wow. my job and then, you know, decided to go all in with it. It is freaking addicted. It's like crack. It really is. That's what I tell people all the time. Um, you know, it's like this adult game of monopoly. Yeah. Is what I explain it. Uh, yeah, but- I would- I always tell people that when, when we are in a meeting or something, we always ended up talking about real estate and I was like, I need to kind of like cut that off and talk about something else. But it's, it's a lot of pleasure because I really love that. So that, that's, that's why. Here's the thing about real estate. Cause I know we were just talking about uh, events, you know, Liz mm-hmm. and I went to the same event last year and I was explaining to my husband why I pay for my own airfare, pay for my own hotel and essentially work for free for three days. <laughs> Come home exhausted and I can't talk because I'm, I lost my voice. And the thing that I have figured out about it all is real estate investors. It's not a job for us. It's a lifestyle decision, yeah. right? So when you throw a bunch of people who are passionate about, how they choose to live their life, right? And about passion about waking up every day and not actually working because what they do is not considered a job to them. You throw them in a bunch of room and then you add alcohol. And like, yeah, <laughs> like 12 hours later, they will still be talking. You know, it is like, it is nonstop talking. It is. There's so many things you've said. I, I want to kind of dissect a little bit. I, you know, with regards to the, the 18 properties in nine months, that's really impressive. So like walk us through that. Was that, did you have, there's so many different philosophies of, you know, find the deal and then the money will follow. Did you line up your financing first? I'm curious, how did, how did, you, dice, how did you get that in place so that you can move so quickly? Yep. So I lined up the financing first. Um, I own those properties myself um, and did not raise capital to invest in those properties. Um, awesome. It was capital that I had from a, the third property we did was an estate sale. We bought it. It was a total piece of work. Uh, and completely rehabbed the house and then was able to pull the cash out of that house about seven months later um, and then used that capital to, to invest. Um, that bought us the first 10. And then the, la- the last half of it was money I borrowed from my brother. Um, mm-hmm. I borrowed money for 18 months from him to use as down payments um, and then was able to pay him back. And that was just a private, you know, between him and I thing. Um, so I'm a big believer in you have to have the money first, right? Yeah. Uh, I, I could never imagine like finding a deal and then trying to find the money. Uh, yeah. But I'm also a control freak. So that's kind of part of the, the problem, we'll call it, you know, <laughs> we'll call it a problem. Or opportunity, right? Oppor- depends yeah. On, yeah, it depends on your perspective. I've learned to leverage my, yeah. my faults, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So how we worked it out with the bank, uh, it was very interesting, actually. I, you know, I was investing out of state. So the properties, I live in Chicago, the properties are in Milwaukee. It's about 90 miles away. It's not like Mm -hmm. it's that far. Um, And I could not find anyone to work with me. So I had a, I had a set of properties I'd already kind of looked at. I had in mind, I think it was maybe seven or eight properties. I had like the numbers down and I literally just like sat there with Google and called every single potential bank in the world. Like after 30 calls, like no one would work with me. Mm. Um, I was still too new. I only had three properties under my belt. I'd only been doing this for like three years at this point. Um, and I was out of state. Mm. So like I was, I mean, I was posting on LinkedIn, like who wants to give me money? Right? Like <laughs> someone's got to give me money. Um, and it turned out someone responded to that okay. LinkedIn ad. I love that. Um, and said, hey, I've got a commercial broker. Let me send this over to him. And then if he thinks he can work with you, he'll give you a call. I remember the guy called me on a Sunday morning. He's like, hey, I've got someone that's going to work with you. It's going to cost you, right? It's, a two, it's going to cost you two points to broker this relationship. Mm-hmm. Uh, but after that, you're welcome to use them. I've already sent him like your tax returns. I've sent him information about you, the portfolio. He says we're good. And I only get paid if this deal goes forward. Mm. I was like, fine, what else am I going to do? Um, and that's the bank I've used the entire time. So I wow. have 18 properties that I personally own. And then I have another 10 with partners. Um, and we've pretty much used this bank the entire time. Um, wow. they're very, so I had to learn from them as well, what their criteria was, how do they underwrite? Right. Um, and learned to, so that way, when I was looking at deals, I put it all into a metric that they were going to use. Um, to see like, hey, they are going to approve this. Is this above a 1.2 DSCR? Mm. Is this above a certain cap rate? Um, so that was kind of made the relationship a lot easier was I wasn't even bringing them things that they weren't going to lend down in the first place. 
That, that's huge because I feel like in so many ways, the banking relationship, people talk about, you know, the, obviously equity and having the down money, but the banking relationship is really gets under, it doesn't get discussed enough. I don't, I don't think personally. It's incredibly important. It, it is. It's everything. I mean, you really can't, I mean, so, you know, you're, you're, you're it's, it's where you're going to be able to grow. And, and so what do you think, ladies listening to this, do they need to have in place so you are bankable? So it depends on which way you're going. Cause I've like, I've done residential and commercial. Those are two different worlds. Sure. Uh, sure. But the, I mean, the thing that's universal in my opinion is understanding banking guidelines, mm-hmm. right? Understanding underwriting things. Like there's so many things that I've learned along the way. Um, like, Hey, once you get to five properties, you can't cash out refinance on any property that you don't own or occupy, you know? And if you don't know that, uh, and you've got equity sitting in your properties and you're like, Oh, I'll eventually get to it. Well, once you buy five, you're SOL, you know, what are you going to do? Sell a property to get your equity out? Like you right. need things that you need to know. Hmm. Um, and I find it very, that's on the residential side, just so you know, mm-hmm. um, you know, what are seasoning requirements? You know, people are like, oh, well, I'm going to go, you know, rehab this property and pull cash out. Well, what's a seasoning requirement? Mm-hmm. You know, if you have a hard money loan that's due with a huge balloon in five months and the seasoning requirement is six months, what are you going to do? Uh, these are all things that I think are very important and that helps you understand right, how to reposition yourself. Um, mm-hmm. Another thing is debt to income ratios. That's on the residential side. Um, that determines how much loan you'll get approved for. And I always explain it to people to understand, you know, I was getting a loan a couple of years ago. I was doing a cash out refinance or something and the lender had said, you know, your, your equity position allows you to pull out, let's say $100,000. But based on your debt to income ratio, you can only pull out 50. Mm. Um, and I was like, cool, I'll pay off my car. Then we're good to go to get the 100. He's like, what do you mean you'll pay off your car? I said, well, my car, I owe $6,000 on my car. It's a $400 a month car payment. That equals $80,000 in approval according to debt to income ratios. I'll pay off the car tomorrow, give you the you know, clean note, and then I can get approved for $80,000 more. And he was like, oh, I've never thought of it like that. <laughs> That's a great. Of it like that. You're you know, welcome. like there's, it's all, these are all things that, like understanding, right. will help you position your ability to grow. Mm. I, I love what you're saying. And I want to dissect a little bit because I think that that's such an important point. You're not going to waste the lender's time. If you really focus on only sending them deals that match their requirements. And in the okay. past that have given me like less than 24 hours um, approvals and term sheets, which made a difference of me getting the deal or not. Yeah. So having that, doing the homework, and I, I could not emphasize that even more. And I'm very thankful that you, you mentioned that because that is a homework that you can be doing even before start looking at anything, talk to several lenders, compare, oh, okay, this is like, origination fee here is 1%, here is 3%. Oh, they do require a uh, reserve um, for the monthly payments or they don't have seasoning fee um, period or don't, every single thing. And if you don't know that, seek for help. Yeah. Other people that did it and say, hey, quick question on this here, does it sound like, something that's normal or not, because that's going to make a difference in you might getting a, a property or not, depending on how fast you can get those things done. Yeah. I mean, I think to me, the, the number one most important thing to start with is understanding financing, what you're approved for, <clears throat> what that means, um, how to change your approval, right? Understanding debt to income, all that stuff. Um, and then kind of planning out your timeline, right? How are you going to, Hey, my goal is 10 properties. Awesome how are you going to get there? Right. How much cash do you have? What kind of loan terms can you get? Um, again, understanding that like once you get to five, the, the down payment requirements change, the credit requirements change. Uh, there's different things that come into play. These are all things that you kind of need to understand. Mm-hmm. You know, when are you going to go into commercial? Cause once you get to 10, then what, you know, if your goal is mm-hmm. 20, you got to go to commercial. Uh, what are those terms like? Right. Yeah. Uh, how do you get approved for that? These are all things that, uh, it's free, right? It doesn't cost you anything to learn and it will help you get there faster. Yeah. And, and also how 
your employment situation is going to impact your bankableness, yep. if that's yep. such a word. I mean, I remember, you know, so many people talk about, oh, I'm going to quit my, quit my job and invest in real estate. And, and that's, that's certainly a path. But, you know, so many times they want to see the personal guarantee. They want to know, are you, they're not just investing in the deal, they're investing in you. And they want to know, are you going to pay back the loan? Yeah. And what's the, what, what, how do we mitigate our risk, right? That's what banks are in the business of. And I remember when we had like a, we had our portfolio and we were kind of getting to, you know, we were growing and, and getting to a different phase. And I remember, you know, at that point we were like, okay, not only do we, we were in the phase of, okay, we've kind of tapped our own finances and our own resources. Now we kind of have to kind of position and start looking at bringing in some partners. And I remember one of the first partners we had, it wasn't just about the money. It was, it was actually, he, he had a very high paying job and it became such a helpful part of our business growth because, mm -hmm. you know, we were, we had great credit, uh, but we, neither of us had, you know, W2 income and that made a difference with this particular bank. So yeah. um, it becomes less important as you grow your portfolio, you know, obviously, but, mm -hmm. but when you're in that, okay, I got to get here and I'm here. Those are the personal guarantees and the, the employment actually becomes having someone on your team that becomes huge. Um, so people just like, oh, I'm just going to quit my job and, you know, they're going to be, you know, be bankable. That's tough. That's a tough it's one unless tough. you get a ton of cash, which is awesome. But some people so don't. So I didn't hate my job. Like a lot of people are like, oh my God, I hate my job. Like I can't wait to quit and do real estate. I wasn't like that. Um, like my intentions were never really to quit my job and to do real estate full time. Mm -hmm. It just got to the point where my real estate had become such an obsession that it, it was distracting me at work, right? My, my heart was no longer mm, in it. Yeah. Um, but I had asked my bank before I, even, before I even considered putting my notice in, will this affect my ability to move forward with more houses? Yeah. At that point, we had just bought five. Okay. So the other 13, I was you know, still planning on buying and they had said, no, I'm like, you sure? Cause I'm going to quit my job. And they're like, you're good. I'm like, if they would have said like, Hey, this is going to be a problem. I would have stayed, you know, yeah. what hands down the, the W2 thing, especially when you're getting started is so important. Also again, things people need to understand when you do quit your job, you have to have two years of that income on mm -hmm. your taxes for it to count. So like mm -hmm. I started another business, I quit my job in July of 2014. That's a great point. I started another business in August of 2014. I, so 2014 was like a couple of months of income. 2015 was my first full year, but you know, it was still like my first year in the business. And then 2016 was like my first full, like hundred percent year. It wasn't until the 2018 that I was actually able to use a hundred percent of that income from that business because I had to wait two full years. Um, and that was when I had my 2016 and 2017 taxes done. Mm -hmm. So understand that it's not like, oh, great, you know, quit my yeah. job tomorrow and get a loan. It takes yeah. six years to build up yeah. that income yeah. to be able to use it. A hundred percent. And you mentioned that right now you have several business. Tell yeah. me, tell me a little bit more about each business and how you divide your time uh, sure. growing them. That's a great question. Um, so I have just under 100 units uh, in the Chicago, Milwaukee market. That's business number one um, is that portfolio. Uh, I also own my own brokerage company. We've got a team of investor agents in Chicago. I'm one of the top 10% of real estate agents in the Chicago land area and then manage obviously a couple of other agents on my team. Um, I'm the co-founder of the Midwest Real Estate Networking Summit, which is a two-day conference in June in Chicago for real estate investors. It's like 400 real estate investors mm -hmm. that... I coordinate because, you know, it's fun. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and then I also am one of the co-founders of turnkeyreviews.com, uh, which is a website for out-of-state real estate investors. Hmm. Um, I also have a monthly meetup group I've been running as well. So those are like my four main businesses and I work less than 30 hours a week. Um, so that has been something that, like you said in the beginning of the call, it's taken time to get there. It's not like I woke up one day and was like, man, I just want to work 30 hours a week. Right. Uh, I've had to learn to be very selfish mm -hmm. um, and to put myself first. So, so one of the things I do is that I just don't accept in-person meetings. Um, I will gladly do a phone call. Um, again, if the, if the topic is relevant to me. Um, so I always ask like, hey, what did you want to discuss in this call? Email it to me um, so that I can see like, hey, I can skim through the questions and make sure that what I will be able to contribute to the conversation is going to be valuable. You know, if you're talking about flipping or wholesaling, things I've never done, I will just respond back and say, you know, I'm probably not the best person. Uh, 
sorry, that is what it is. Um, I work from home as well. So that makes it a little bit easier is I don't have to get ready. I don't have to put makeup on, you know, like I don't have to put pants on, uh, you know, videos are from the chest up, right? So <laughs> this part looks great. Exactly. This part's yoga pants, right? Uh, so it allows me though to be more efficient. Um, I schedule everything. I also, you said uh, earlier, when people just win or they call you, I find it so rude when someone just calls me and starts talking. Um, you know, we have to have an appointment. I have to know what the appointment's going to be about. Again, being selfish with my time. Um, I've also tried to limit the amount of what I consider my time to be as non-revenue generating. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a couple of different things. People always talk about delegation, uh, you know, and I, I've seen people who like will delegate out their entire business. I'm actually not a fan of that. Um, I'm still very involved with almost everything in my business. Yes, I have property managers that handle the day-to-day, -day, but I don't delegate out every little task. Um, but what I do do is I've gone through, it started off a couple of years ago, um, where I kind of, at the end of each day, wrote down what I was spending my time on, right? Mm. I worked eight hours today. <clears throat> what did I do today? Right. And then kind of kept track of that for like a week and then reflected on it and kind of categorized things. You know, I spent six hours last week on marketing. I hate marketing, right? I'm basically illiterate. Someone has to write stuff for me and do copy for me. Um, so like that I'm going to hire out, you know, I spent four hours last week on accounting. I actually like ac accounting and I still do all my own accounting, even though my properties are managed by managers, I take all of their information and I put it into my own database and that lets me understand things. So we just had a situation where, you know, I got a bill for fixing the flooring. I'm like, didn't we just fix the flooring six months ago? I'm like I knew that off the top mm. of my head. I remembered that. So by me looking at it, glancing through a report that they provide me, I'm not gaining that information, that insight, but by me doing it myself. So I still do that stuff. So every week I wrote down what I was spending my time doing and then reflected on that. Um, you know, again, a lot of the time is spent doing crap, you know, things that are <laughs> unnecessary. Um, and I just stopped doing that. Um, that was part of it as well. Um, and then again, I schedule everything out. Um, you know, if I'm doing, I do phone calls, right. I had a, a block yesterday of maybe four hours where I just had back to back 30 minute phone calls. Boom. I'm done for the day. Um, I'm done for a few days actually. Um, that's just how I, I schedule my life. But again, making my family a priority and looking at that perspective of every minute doing something else is time away from my family. Right. So what is it worth to me? And I said, I try to keep it down to about two hours a week of non revenue generating things. Right. So that's when taking a phone call um, to help someone else out that I don't know, that would kind of fall into that sort of category. It's a great, um, great, a lot of great points there. I mean, having, making a list of your revenue generating activity and your non-revenue -re generating activities is a huge poly aha for people. I mean, that's like, I'm like, I got to do that after our call. Not in that, but like I just like started. I'm like, I got to do that. Like really get clear. I mean, I, they, I know it in my head, but do I have like a list that I have put together and I can really zone in on that? Like, that's awesome. You know, that's a great suggestion. Um, the other thing that, that I love what you said is about if you want to make a change in your, in your life, diary what you're doing today. I mean, people have said that about, you know, I've talked to people about, the, the, you know, food. They're like, well, what do you eat? I'm like, well, I can tell you what I ate today, but I don't really know what I ate yesterday. Mm -hmm. But if I had written it down, I've been like, oh yeah, I, I did. Oh yeah, I had that piece of chocolate to it. Yeah, I forgot. I have, I have to have a little chocolate. But you do, you have to write what you're trying to shift around down so you can reflect. I love that, you know, concept too, because it's very, God, people don't, one, actually track anything. And number two, reflect on it and then make changes. That's it's super important. Even like yeah. with personal finance. I remember, you know, when we started this, like, hey, how are we going to afford houses? Uh, you know, budgeting, right? That's number one thing. You know, you can either make more money, which is hard for most people, or you can cut back on your spending. Right. And I remember we used uh, mint.com, which is a great yes. website. You can load in, you know, your previous transactions and mm -hmm. My husband at the time looked at it. I'm like, you spent $800 last month on fast food. And he's like, no, I just get things. Like every once in a while I go and get things off the dollar menu. I'm like, that's $800 a month, right? <laughs> and like, you don't, when it's a couple of bucks here and there, yeah, you don't you're not really exactly. thinking about it. But when you start tracking it and you start seeing like, oh, like Starbucks is a big one for people too. You know, 
I've had friends who are like, oh my God, I'm spending, you know, $500 a month on Starbucks. Uh, <laughs> but it's, it's that process of, of seeing, right. And then deciding, being aware of it. Right. And, and I'm not saying like, you can't have Starbucks, but maybe once a week and now it becomes a treat. Um, that's the same sort of concept with your life um, and with your schedule, um, prioritizing things as well, you know, and I follow the uh, getting things done method of, of organization. If you've ever read that book, I was too busy to read the book. So I bought the cliff notes off of Amazon, <laughs> <You're funny. laughs> but it's a time management thing. I've been doing okay. that for a few years and it's been life changing. Okay. I love, I love what you're saying. And it, it boils down to awareness. It to is. Mm-hmm. Being aware of what you're doing. And I think that a lot of people don't track because they're like, I oh, know, I don't want to even know how much I spend on Starbucks or anything else. But I, I believe that if you're committed to bigger things in life, if you mm-hmm. want to really create exceptional memories with your, your family and you want to do different things, those are the, the, the moments that you're going to get down and really understand your finances. And we're not talking about anything complicated. We're talking about tracking your expenses and pretty, pretty simple math. I'm very curious to understand your mentality when you started and when you are right now, because a lot of people that are starting, they, they're trying to get ready to get ready. And they buy one house in first year, maybe they take too long. What do you think in your case made a difference regarding your mindset? Uh, I don't know. You don't know that? (laughs) But I did absolutely no planning, right? I just like went and did it. Um, I didn't, I said, I still, I didn't even look at accounting systems until I had like 26 units and then was like, damn, I can't be doing this in Excel. You know, um, I was, I was do something and then figure out the details later, um, which was good and bad, right? Uh, I definitely, I definitely lost a lot of money because I didn't have systems and processes in place. Um, so we were somewhat disorganized and I am an extremely organized person. But I was like, oh, well, we'll figure it out, you know? And uh, I could have planned a little bit better, would have been a little bit easier to keep track of some stuff. Um, but I don't know, like there wasn't anything different or mindset. It was just like, hey, I'm doing this and just go do it, right? Uh, you know, I think one of the things that not only uh, investors, but people in general have is doubt, right? So I mentioned before, one of my businesses is I'm a real estate agent, right? And my business is all investors. And my, my pitch or the thing that I always say to people is, listen, my job is to educate you enough to make your own decisions right? When you're making an offer on a property, if you're up at night worried, you know, how am I going to pay for Mm. this? This is the right decision. My answer to you is you're just not ready yet. And that's okay. It takes time. It takes generally six to nine months for a client that's working with me to get to the point where they are a hundred percent confident in making that offer. But at the end of the day, I am not talking you into it, right? I'm not the one who is up at night worried about that stuff. Uh, I sleep like a baby. So be, it's okay to take that time. Uh, but when you're talking about years, we know then we're getting into like the whole analysis paralysis thing. Right. And, uh, you know, you might need to shift your expectations, right? If you're not finding a deal in this market and it's been a year, right. Then maybe you, the, the, the thing is the market will not deliver what you would consider to be a deal. So either adjust your expectations or change market right? But don't just sit there and wait, you know, like, oh, I've got to find it. It's got to be perfect. Nothing is perfect. Wait till you're a landlord, right? (laughs) (laughs) It is not perfect. Uh, It's messy. You know, it's super messy. We were just talking about, said Chicago was negative 50 last week. I had at least nine clients who had pipes burst. You know, uh, landlording is not perfect. I had someone drive into my house and knock Mm -hmm. my my house off of like the cinder block is falling over in the foundation. Mm -hmm. I had someone blow up my garage, Um, you know, like there's all these things that happen to being like as a landlord. And if your expectation is like, Hey, this is good. I've got to be a hundred percent perfect. Like, (laughs) Oh man, it's going to be a very stressful life for you. And I think what you're saying is, is, is so important. It's like, you're continually course correcting, right? So it's like continuous, like improvement. And I think, okay, I did this, we're going to shift here and then we're going to, you know, move on and, and, and just go make it happen, you know, versus, 
you know, overthinking it or what have you, you know, which I think you have to, um, you know, I said, I've shifted multiple times throughout the business. What I, what I, when I started this almost eight years ago, uh, and where I thought I would be is, is night and day. Um, and it's gone in a good way. Uh, but I said, I've just kept myself open to opportunity. You know, I always thought I was going to be managing my portfolio, like hands on, um, and then realized I don't like it. A, um, it's not a good use of my time B and my time, the money I spend on property management is a hundred percent worth what I gain in being able to focus on other businesses, um, that are higher revenue generating per hour for me. Um, Mm -hmm. so why would I, you know, spend, let's say $25 an hour managing properties when I can make $200 an hour being an agent, you know, it just doesn't make sense. Um, great way to think of it, right? Understanding, you know, again, understanding where your skill sets lie. Um, that's another big thing. Understanding what you're not good at. You know, there's a million things I'm not good at. I don't even try to do them anymore because the time it takes me to do it is probably triple what it would take someone who likes to do those sort of things. Um, and it's not worth me stressing out or, you know, when I can just pay someone to do it. But marketing for me is a big one. I am awful. Uh, this event we have coming up in June my business partner on the event is he's marketing by background. Uh, and it said he, he edits these videos and like makes all these graphics and like writes all this stuff for the website. And every single time I'm like, man, it will take me like two weeks to do something half as good. Um, but that's his specialty. Like, and that's what he's good at. And luckily, you know, when it comes to a partnership that we complement each other in those aspects. Beautiful. That's awesome. Yeah. I mean, and that's so important is it's, it sounds like you've, you've really, in order to have these multiple businesses and be able to work with how, you know, however long you want to work and put those standards in place, you know, having those partnerships and being able to see that, right. And saying, because you can't, I, I find people often ask us, and I'm sure both of you get this, like, you know, I need a partner and will you be my partner? I mean, I've even gotten just like, it's like, I, I don't even know the person and they want to partner with me. What's like, your name, by the way? I'm like, um, but, but what, what, if you dissect that, Yes, it's a, it's a nice compliment, certainly. However, what, what the challenge with any of that approach is that if you have not done the actual work on what am I good at, what am I not good at, what do I bring to the table, what are my gaps, all of it, like it's a serious self-evaluation and business evaluation as well, because there's things that we do well in our business and there's things that we don't do well. And, and if you don't- and that's okay. And that's okay. Yeah. It's, it's, it's more than okay because in, yeah. I forget the story. It's a great, great story about all these animals. And it's basically what happens in the story. I'm going to totally butcher the story, but I haven't read it in a while. But the, the, the animals are all in the school. It's the animal school. And they're just forced to, you know, basically take all the same courses. And, and the one like the elephant's really good at something, you know, and it's just a cute story to show how when we spend time doing things we're not good at, it actually takes away from mm-hmm. you developing like your core genius is what the core. whole point yeah. of it was. But people often don't, you know, think about that, you know? So, um, no, I love that. I love that. Um, I love right. that concept. I love the, the boundaries you put out, Brie, because I think as, as investors, as women, as people, everyone can, you know, really, really learn a little bit more about that and get better at it, practicing it in their life. And you, you do, your sounds like you're doing a, an amazing job at it. So, Well, I think one of the challenges, uh, so I'm not a mom yet, um, but I've got friends who are moms and, you know, know something about parenting. Uh, But we didn't grow up in a world of Instagram or Facebook where everyone's posting how perfect their lives are, you know, like, and it just terrifies, like, the the parenting part does not terrify me. What terrifies me is the mom groups, right? Like, (laughs) of my having to associate, right? And these, like, oh my God, you don't feed your kid gluten-free, like, my kid eats his boogers. I don't know. <laughs> like, that sort of lifestyle, right? But I think that oh, yeah. we try to be perfect and we try to emulate this life of, you know, everything is perfect. My child's perfect. My house is yeah. perfect. My husband's yeah. perfect. And mm-hmm. I, there's no way I would ever I even attempt at that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, and I think that is, is something that women need to understand is, Hey, like there's a, that movie with Sarah Jessica Parker. Like, how does she do it all? I'm like, why would you want to do it all? <laughs> I don't want to do it all. I really do not. Yeah, um, it's good perspective. You know, why? Um, and understanding that like, and that's not only okay, like that's my choice. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't want to do it all. Hell no, 100%. that's exhausting. 
Yeah. Good, good, good perspective. It's a really good perspective. And what, where do I want to spend my time? And what, if I put my time here, what, you know, what happens then? Like, wh- where is it going to, what something's got to shift, you know? And mm-hmm. I've, I've done that where I'm like, you know, I really like to keep my house tidy and, you know, we just moved recently. So I'm just trying to keep up, you know, and I'm like, no, it's going to just, dishes are going to stay in the sink and I'm getting to the gym because that is more of a priority than the dishes. I'll get to it. It's not going to stay there for a week, you know, but, but it's okay that I'm leaving the house with an untie. Like it's for me, that's something in my, I have no idea where that came from, like a past life, but I have this like crazy, like I got to keep my house tidy every minute of the day. I have no idea. I got, you know, going to therapy on that one, but regardless, (laughs) I'm like, I'm like you. Yeah. I'm getting better at like, I see specks of things on the floor. I'm okay. We had a Super Bowl party recently and I'm like, this house is a disaster. But I'm going to the gym because I just ate like the entire taco nacho dip. So I'm like, I got to get to the gym. The, the robot vacuum has been awesome in my life. Oh, um, that's, I've just heard that from someone the other day. Dude, I wipe everything on the floor and I said it. It goes off at like 4.30 in the morning. So well, like by the time we are up, it is that. done. I run it like every day in my house and that. just wipe everything on the floor. At night, I kind of just walk through and like, you know, I'll put stuff in, in piles and wipe things on the floor. And then the robot vacuum cleans while I sleep. The robo vacuum. Yeah. I got to look, I got to get that on. I got to look on, on Amazon on that. I've You're the second hours. person in the second day that has told me about that. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know how I ever survived before it. Cause I'm super anal too, you know, and my husband is a really messy eater. I'm sorry. He's, <laughs> he's going to hear me. You know, like it's mind blowing, right? Mind blowing. Uh, like peanuts, like all over the floor, just all over the floor. Uh, we actually have like a, like a little handheld vacuum to like vacuum him while he's eating them. Oh <laughs> my gosh. That's um, another level. And like now I just don't stress. I'm like, sweet, leave it on the floor. The vacuum's going to clean it up. Tonight. Yeah, we got yeah. that. Oh, that's great. Uh, so it that. works. That's awesome. Uh, well, Bree, thank you so much. You've been absolutely yeah. amazing. How can the ladies listening learn more about you and learn about your um, amazing event coming up in June? Sure. Um, so I'm on Bigger Pockets, uh, Bree Schmidt, um, as well as LinkedIn. Those are probably the two places to connect with me. Um, and then the, the summit is in June, it's June 1st and 2nd. It's a two day event. Uh, it's one of those, you know, no one on stage is selling this get rich quick crap, right? Uh, <laughs> It's, it's all real investors that are sharing their life experiences with investing, the good, the bad, the ugly. Uh, that's kind of the premise of the event. And we like to try to find investors who don't have Cinderella stories. Uh, you know, last year, our keynote went from 4,000 units to $26 million in debt and then built himself back up again and started a new business. Like, how do you come back from $26 million in debt? I don't know. I couldn't do it. Hmm. Uh, so that's the event. It's MidwestRESummit.com. So let's go to our fabulous three questions now. The first one is, what's the most transformational book you have ever read? Uh, for me, it would be Getting Things Done, which I mentioned I would read the quick notes. Uh, it's an organizational method, um, but it really helped me de-stress um, and to, to set my day, my week, and my, my life up in a way that I'm not worried about things. So the, one of the things in the book is they they said they spend so much time worrying about what needs to get done or trying to remember what needs to get done by writing it all down. It takes away that mental energy. And that was a really impactful thing for me. That's a great aha. Uh-huh. The second question is what's the most powerful routine you do to create a financially free and balanced life? And I think you mentioned that, but let's see if there's anything. Yeah. I'd say awareness. Well, awareness, right? Um, awareness when it said within business finances, all those things is really important. Um, I also am not one of those get up at four o'clock in the morning type people. Uh, I sleep. I don't set an alarm clock. I don't have kids. Keep in mind. Uh, I sleep till when my body tells me it's time to get up generally around seven, seven thirty in the morning. Cause I feel that when my body decides it's time to get up, I am a hundred percent ready to go for my day. I'm not exhausted. I am not trying to do a million things at once. Uh, I'm focused a hundred percent on my business and that allows me to, uh, to accomplish things quicker. Beautiful. The last question is, which woman, famous or not, has inspired you the most? Um, I don't know, really. Uh, I would have to say probably Oprah, um, just because that she's, uh, she's obviously accomplished so much and in so many different aspects of things. Right. Um, I can't imagine, I don't, I don't know anyone that's done more than she has. And she's a Chicago girl. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <around>. right. <laughs> 
<laughs> awesome. Well, Bree, thank you so much for being on our show. Thanks for sharing all your nuggets of wisdom and, uh, and thanks for all you're doing for the investor community, what you're putting together in June and hopefully get a lot of, a lot of ladies out there and, and uh, you know, to, to join in the event. So thanks for being on our show. Yeah, of course. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. If you enjoyed this podcast and want to receive updates on our next interviews, go to our website, therealestateinvestor.com. There, you can subscribe to our show, become part of our investor community, and get updates on upcoming episodes. If you like our show, please share it with other women who would benefit. And don't forget to leave us a rating on iTunes. We'd really appreciate it. And as always, we encourage you to take one action as a result of today's show and put it into motion so you can live both a financially free and balanced life. Thanks for spending time with us. Ciao.